Jim Gordon was one of the top rock drummers of the 1970s, but that all changed when a schizophrenic break landed him in prison for murder. Tragically, he wasn't the only 70s rock star to get involved with the law. Frontman of the pioneering heavy metal group Black Sabbath throughout the 1970s, Ozzy Osbourne had arguably his biggest career moments in that decade. Known for his wild personality and even wilder onstage persona, he's also had his share of run-ins with the law. Arrested in 1984 in Memphis for public drunkenness, and again in 1989 for attempting to kill his wife Sharon Osbourne while in a drug-fueled haze, his most well-known run-in with the law came in Texas in 1982. According to Rolling Stone, while visiting San Antonio for a concert in February of that year, Ozzy was caught urinating at a monument near the famous Alamo landmark and was subsequently arrested and jailed for public intoxication and urination. Look what I'm doing to the United States of America, man. I'm a public threat. Thankfully for his thousands of fans who came to the city to see him perform, Ozzy was able to make bail and play the gig at the Hemisphere Arena. Banned from the state for a decade, he would eventually be pardoned for the offense after donating to a local charity. And in 2015, he made an emotional visit back to the site of his famous failure. Trailblazing funk legend George Clinton came to fame in the 1970s as the leader of the iconoclastic parliament, as well as founder of the psychedelic funk rock group Funkadelic. Over the years, his collective of rotating musicians became known as Parliament Funkadelic, and Clinton has become widely known as the Prime Minister of Funk. With the ability to blend disparate musical styles together, Clinton was an industry outsider who managed to forge a legacy in the genre matched by few others, and his style and influence in music and fashion cannot be understated. But as the foremost artist working in the psychedelic genre, it should come as no surprise that Clinton was mixed up in the drug scene from the very beginning. He faced serious charges and different incidents throughout his career, but at least one of those charges led to consequences. As reported by the Los Angeles Times, in 2003, he was arrested for drug possession when officers found him in his car with a large quantity of cocaine and other drug paraphernalia. Clinton voluntarily admitted what he had on him and pleaded no contest. He was handed down a sentence of 200 hours of community service and two years of probation. As part of the pioneering folk rock group Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, David Crosby had quite the musical career, but also a controversial personal life. While he and Stephen Stills, Graham Nash, and Neil Young were lighting up the airwaves with hits like Our House, Crosby himself was battling drug problems, particularly a cocaine addiction. In 1982, however, things became more serious when he was arrested on drug and weapons charges at a Dallas nightclub for possession of a handgun and use of cocaine. After failing a stint in rehab as part of a plea deal, he was sentenced to five years in prison, though he was ultimately released on parole after just five months. Any place else in the country, I would have been dismissed and not even brought to trial. Unfortunately, his drug problems and legal issues returned to haunt him. In March of 2004, Crosby was taken into custody at his Times Square Hotel in New York City after playing a show in Wayne, New Jersey. Apparently, Crosby had left behind an incriminating piece of luggage that contained not just drugs, in this case marijuana and associated paraphernalia, but also a loaded 45 caliber handgun. Crosby pled guilty this time and received a fine. KISS became a quintessential 1970s arena rock band thanks to a unique hook. Its members took on the personas of mythical characters, donning costumes and wearing makeup. Alongside Paul Stanley, Gene Simmons, and Peter Criss, Ace Fraley played lead guitar on KISS rockers like Detroit Rock City, Rock and Roll All Night, and Plastercaster. According to Guitar World, Stanley and Simmons fired Fraley from KISS in the early 1980s for his unreliability, brought on by substance abuse. In May 1983, Fraley was driving his DeLorean in White Plains, New York, when he got involved in a small wreck. As he argued with the driver of the other vehicle, police arrived, prompting Fraley to flee. A high-speed pursuit ensued, during which Fraley reached speeds of 90 miles per hour, nicking other cars along the way, then drove around a roadblock before he abandoned the car and was arrested while on foot. Fraley was charged with drunken and reckless driving, and after entering a guilty plea, was sentenced to five years of probation. Two years after that incident, Fraley was arrested again. He and his wife Jeanette were charged with criminal possession of forged instruments after they were caught allegedly attempting to buy a controlled substance with a phony prescription. The Steve Miller Band's greatest hits 1974 to 1978 is one of the best-selling albums of all time, with more than 15 million copies purchased. The group, led and fronted by San Francisco guitarist and singer Steve Miller, still dominates classic rock radio with well-known blues-inflected 70s standards like Take the Money and Run and Fly Like an Eagle. But it hasn't exactly been smooth sailing. 
On his 29th birthday in 1972, according to Rolling Stone, Miller drank two bottles of wine, then hit a Dallas bar for scotch. Later that night, he was arrested in the Dallas suburb of Highland Park for public intoxication and prowling. Then in April 1975, police responded to a call at Miller's house and found a large fire burning. Its contents? The clothing and possessions of Miller's friend, Benita Diorio. Miller was reportedly responsible for the bonfire. When confronted by police, Miller got into an altercation and was booked on a charge of resisting arrest. All charges were later dropped. The Clash helped usher in the age of punk rock in the late 1970s. Highly political with lyrics heavily critical of institutions, the UK band would bring in reggae, dance, and disco elements to round out their sound, reflecting a commitment to being a mouthpiece of Britain's disaffected youth. In 1978, according to Chris Solevich's redemption song, The Clash played a show at the Apollo Theatre in Glasgow, Scotland. The punk band put on a charged performance that agitated the audience to the point where bouncers and security guards allegedly roughed up some fans. Frontman Joe Strummer witnessed the violence and got so mad that he ended the band's performance and left the stage. At that point, other fans confronted Strummer and took him to task for not doing more to stop the bouncer attacks. According to Clash member Mick Jones, he was so angry he smashed a bottle and was immediately jumped on by plainclothes policemen. Two years later, Strummer would be arrested for another violent concert incident. While playing a show in Hamburg, Germany, several fans stormed the stage and attempted to grab the microphone to accuse the Clash of selling out. Strummer grew so incensed that he struck one fan in the head with his guitar. He was arrested and charged with assault. Big-voiced and soulful, Boz Skaggs injected some musical flavor into the guitar-based mainstream rock of the 1970s. An early member of the Steve Miller Band, Skaggs went solo and incorporated blues, jazz, R&B, and horns into pop rock, scoring big hits in the process with Lido Shuffle and Lowdown, as well as the multi-platinum disco-adjacent LP Silk Degrees. In August 1985, according to the Associated Press, Skaggs was arrested and charged with a long list of vehicular crimes. After driving through a red light in San Francisco, police stopped the musician and issued a field sobriety test. Skaggs didn't pass, and police took him in and booked him at San Francisco's city prison for suspected driving under the influence of alcohol, along with running a red light and driving without his license on his person. He was a sideman, backing musician, and session drummer, but Jim Gordon ranks among the most prolific and important rock performers of the 1960s and early 1970s. Among the major recordings that included Gordon's drumming, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers debut album, Harry Nilsson's Nilsson Schmilson, The Beach Boys' Pet Sounds, and Derek and the Dominoes' Layla and other assorted love songs. That last one was an Eric Clapton-fronted band best known for its enduring classic rock radio staple, Layla, a hard-rocking lament of unrequited love that Gordon co-wrote. But by the late 1970s, Gordon's career and mental well-being declined. In 1978, Gordon sought treatment for his issues for the first of more than 15 times. Professionals were unable to stop what Gordon claimed was the voice of his mother, mentally torturing him on the inside. In 1983, he told police detectives that he just snapped, and that's why he fatally stabbed his 71-year-old mother. Gordon remained in prison ever since his admission of murder and was denied parole in 2018 after his own attorney expressed worry that the musician could potentially hurt other people if ever released. He died March 2023 while still incarcerated. Keyboardist and singer Billy Preston was a prodigy, backing up gospel icon Mahalia Jackson and appearing on the Nat King Cole show by age 11 before recording with Little Richard in his teens. He became a full-fledged rock star in the early 1970s after he joined the Beatles on the Let It Be album, leading to solo hits like the funk jam Out of Space and the number one hits Will It Go Round in Circles and Nothing From Nothing. According to the Associated Press, in August 1991, Preston drove to an assembly spot for day laborers and hired a 16-year-old boy. Preston then took the teen to his home in Malibu, where he smoked cocaine and then showed the boy photos of a pornographic nature before attempting to assault him. Authorities filed charges of felony cocaine possession, misdemeanor counts of molestation, and showing explicit material to a minor. Preston additionally faced charges over an incident that occurred the day before the encounter with the teenager. He allegedly hired another day laborer, took him to his home, and assaulted him with a deadly weapon. Preston entered a no-contest plea to some of the drug and assault charges as part of a deal, and the sexual crime charges were dismissed. Preston received a sentence of nine months in a drug rehab center and three months of house arrest. Detroit-based hard rocker Ted Nugent fancied himself the Motor City Madman for his energetic, stunt-heavy, and shirtless stage performances. Primarily a guitarist and sometimes a singer, 
Nugent racked up a string of big hits in the 70s and early 80s that touched on violence, debauchery, and criminality, including Stranglehold, Cat Scratch Fever, and Jailbait, the last being about a man's pursuit of a 13-year-old girl. Being a man well into adulthood who was still going after minors was a subject Nugent was reportedly personally familiar with. In his episode of VH1's Behind the Music, Nugent confirmed that he'd engaged in multiple encounters with women who were under the age of 18. He also discussed how in the 1970s, he convinced the parents of his 17-year-old girlfriend to make him her legal guardian. They figured better Ted Nugent than some drug-infested punk in high school. In 2018, Nugent denied the legal maneuvering on the Joe Rogan podcast, claiming he never adopted a teenage girlfriend. Presumably, he doesn't watch VH1. Aerosmith had been scoring hits and filling arenas since the 1970s. The chief creative force in the band, songwriter and lead singer Steven Tyler, who has wailed his way through 50 years of hits like Dream On, Love in an Elevator, and Cryin'. In 2019, California lawmakers created a three-year period in which the victims of sexual assaults could file lawsuits against their abusers, even if criminal charges couldn't be assessed due to the statute of limitations. In December 2022, Julia Misley registered a case in Los Angeles Superior Court alleging sexual assault and battery on the part of 50 defendants, among them Aerosmith singer Steven Tyler. A new lawsuit accuses Aerosmith frontman Steven Tyler of sexual assault of a minor back in the 1970s. Misley alleged that when she was 16, she met 25-year-old Tyler at a 1973 Portland concert and that he took her to his hotel room. Misley confirmed she was a minor, but according to the court documents, Tyler allegedly, quote, performed various acts of criminal sexual conduct, then flew her to other Aerosmith concerts for more encounters. In 1974, the Aerosmith singer filed to become Misley's legal guardian so as to keep her close while touring. She alleges Tyler plied her with drugs and alcohol, continued to assault her, and urged her to abort an unplanned pregnancy. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-4673.